Hello, everyone. I'm Martin Jean. I'm director of the Institute of Sacred Music here at Yale University. We are an interdisciplinary graduate center at Yale for the study and practice of sacred music, worship, and the arts. And today we're continuing our um, reflections uh, from uh, quarantine, this grassroots series of interviews we're doing uh, with our colleagues and friends at the Institute. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Professor Brian Spinks, who is the Bishop F. Percy Goddard, Professor of Liturgical Studies and Pastoral Theology at, uh, at the ISM at Yale Divinity School, and author of dozens and dozens of books and scholarly articles on a liturgical topics ranging from the early church to reform period to the present day. Hello, Brian. Hi, Martin. Nice to see you. I, Thank uh, you. I, every time I look at your bibliography, I feel like to lie down and take a nap. It's both exhausted <laughs> and exhausting. <laughs> Congratulations okay. and, uh, and many thanks for all, you, all that you do. So, Brian, though, those of us who come from certain worship traditions labor under the false assumptions that they never change, right? Uh, they always stay the same. But in point of fact, the books and articles you write tell a very different story, right? Um, in fact, you're, you seem to study moments when the liturgy, in fact, does adapt to its, uh, its sort of context, historical context. And we're living in a period, frankly, right now, where who knows what worship will be like when we emerge from this pandemic, uh, from all this isolation, however long it's going to be. And uh, I think it's a very cogent uh, uh, moment that we, we take, take a look at this in comparison with other points in, in history. So uh, you're just finishing a new book uh, called Scottish Presbyterian Worship, Proposals for Organic Change from 1843 to the Present Day. Now, Brian, why in the world would a nice, Church of England priest like you be studying the worship of Scottish Presbyterians? Okay, Martin, good question. Um, uh, perhaps it's just because I'm insane. Let me begin by saying that um, my, I'm indebted to Scotland for my present family surname. The original surname was Spink. Uh, and my ancestors in the 1800s were um, agricultural workers in Aylsham in Norfolk. Right. But my great-grandparents moved to Scotland with the person they were working for, Colonel, um, and uh, settled in Inverness for two years. My grandfather was born there, George Edward Spinks, in uh, 1896. For some reason, the registrar at Inverness added an S, his surname. When they moved back to, uh, to East Anglia, to Weathers, Essex, his younger siblings, like his parents, were Spink, but he was George Edward Spinks, thanks to Scotland. So that's where I get the family name from. But it's really, um, I think, my theological autobiography that um, explains some of this interest. In my uh, undergraduate and graduate studies uh, at the uh, University of Durham, uh, I read uh, Karl Barth's Romans, uh, commentary on Romans, and then the uh, church dogmatics, or uh, quite a big chunks of the dogmatics, and Calvin's views. Um, I had uh, rebelled very much at this uh, extreme Anglo-Catholic college, not, not the faculty, but many of the students were extreme. I'd read everything liberal that I could get my hands on. Uh, and reading these things brought me back to uh, uh, an orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. uh, and my interest in liturgy, which was encouraged by Arthur Curriton, plus this interest in neology, meshed together. So my first uh, serious postgraduate studies published um, two books were on English reform liturgy. Mm -hmm. And in studying that, I indeed had to look at John Knox's uh, liturgy for Berwick on Tweed, the Genevan form of service and the Westminster Directory. So even then I was looking at um, some of the historical Scottish material. Subsequently I have written on their sacramental theology in the uh, 17th, 18th century. Uh, it was uh, 
I was honoured by being made uh, Vice President and President of the Church Service Society of the Church of Scotland, still only non-Presbyterian and Anglican to hold that office. And then they honoured me again in 2015 by inviting me back to give the lecture of the 150th anniversary of the Founding Church Service Society. And I gave a paper on the 19th century and it's when I realised that actually, although there were some PhDs that went to things in far too much depth, probably, um, uh, there were just essays that sort of skimmed the surface. And so here it was. So I guess the uh, answer to the question, why this uh, Anglican priest, why not? Yeah, right. No, I, I of course knew about your uh, your interest in Calvinist theology and, and so on, but I did not know the, the family history. And that can't uh, that can't just be uh, um, cast aside. That's that's part of you and part of uh, part of what makes make, what makes you unique. So this the book title uh, includes the subtitle "Proposals for Change." Now, why what what changes are you looking at here, and why why is eighteen forty three a particularly significant date? Okay, good question. Eighteen forty three is very important for the Church of Scotland. It is uh, when the disruption occurred, capital D. Uh, a third of the ministers walked out of the established church mm. to form the Free Church of Scotland. And it was over who appoints to parishes, okay. not about worship. But then you had two, already there had been more separations, but then you had two churches that had split over uh, patronage but then went their separate ways for different reasons. Later, they were, most of them reunited again, particularly 1929, but that's, that's another story. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why 1843. Proposals for organic change. Um, people started agitating for better forms of worship rather than extemporary prayer. Uh, and the pioneer in this was Dr. Robert Lee of Grey Friars who uh, actually dropped a liturgy that he used, and then he had it printed, and his congregation had copies. Well, this started a little fight, whether this was legal or illegal in the Church of Scotland. And one particular opponent said that the church was not uh, able to entertain proposals for organic change. Um, of course, he got overruled because subsequently as the century progressed, it's exactly what they did, uh, proposals for organic change. Mm -hmm. To leave aside this remembrance of the Westminster Directory form of service and to go back to forms that were more of the classical pattern. Um, so, uh, but I, I've played with the ideas of organic change um, and evolution and devolution. Organic change was one that was made popular by Anton Bromstark, um, the Roman Catholic lay theologian and liturgical scholar. Well, he said that liturgy actually does uh, change organically. Some conservative Roman Catholic writers have taken that up in more recent times and said that, uh, uh, yes, uh, it changed organically. And an example of this is the 1962 uh, Missal. Uh, and then there was uh, Vatican II with genetic engineering and that brought uh, organic change to an end. In fact, if they'd read Borstart carefully, he said that organic change came to an end with the Council of Trent, because that's when uh, liturgy was standardized. Medieval liturgy, um, is, is vast in its differences, particularly when manuscript, because it was adapted for each church, each diocese, uh, to, to, if you like, to enculturate it. And once you standardize it first through printing, and then with church authority, that organic change comes to an end. So um, Church of Scotland uh, seems to um, be a good example of where there is organic uh, development. Uh, through evolution and devolution. So I've sort of charted how from the 1860s onwards um, forms of liturgy were put out, um, uh, 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 unofficial and official. Uh, and some of the unofficials one by the, the Church Service Society were extremely popular. But they were never put out as a book of common prayer to be used. They were there to raise the standard of uh, worship in Scottish churches uh, to give a, a normative, a, a bar, and then ministers were able to make their own alterations 
uh, and innovations as they desire. So that's the devolution. So the body can put out uh, an evolved form of prayer, taking um, accounts of, of, of the scholarship of the day, uh, be it 19th century or 20th century or now 21st century. And then how it's actually used in a parish is very much up to the minister. And certainly in the 19th century, there are examples from some of the ministers who were involved in the compilation of the uh, Eucologian, the Book of the Church Service Society, which set out a very, what we would regard as a classical shape liturgy, but in their own parishes only used little bits and pieces to supplement the form that was in use because it would have been unacceptable to their parishioners to simply change the format. So you see that dual change. And although I haven't... Um, gone into great details and, and laboured this through the, the book, I tried to start by saying that what we find is, first of all, internal change, comparable to what's called the Hox genes in, in us, that uh, something happens and triggers um, in, in life some sort of um, uh, adaptation to the changes. Mm. But the, the Hox gene is triggered by something that is external. So in liturgy, there would be something in the church, which is the equivalent of the Hox gene, if you like, but that's in response to something that's in society, a change in culture. So the 19th century stuff is clearly an expression of the Romantic movement. You get the restoration of their churches to, to fit into a Gothic style, uh, going back to a medieval pattern, uh, reintroducing stained glass window. And as you all have to know, the kiss to whistles, the organ was reintroduced <laughs> gradually. And, you know, uh, they were horrified and there were court cases in the mid, uh, 19th century became almost standard by the end of the 19th century. Uh, I, I can well imagine there'd be court cases about the pipe organ, but uh, that's a different story. <laughs> uh, what's the most surprising thing that you've uh, uh, sort of uncovered, surprising to yourself at least, in this particular study that you're engaged in? Uh, surprising how much material has uh, uh, has not been written about before mm. and probably how much material is still out there somewhere. Yeah. Um, particularly uh, in the 19th century, churches were still able to afford to have the set forms of worship or a guide printed, but they were just for the, the church. I found uh, two, two, three, four of those um, and been able to say something about the minister and the church. Um, but I suspect there are many more lying unused, uh, locked away somewhere, because once that minister died or moved, the next minister probably didn't want to use them, and they were set aside. So there's, I think, a wealth of material there still to be covered. Mm. Another thing I discovered quite by chance, uh, a book uh, about uh, written by a son of, uh, about his father, who was one of the... Um, Free Church of Scotland ministers in the islands, uh, that's where it was it, and still is very strong, uh, where they still speak, or as they call it there. And uh, um, he did a radio broadcast. Now, of course, it's extemporary prayer. Whether he wrote uh, that out for that uh, particular broadcast, I don't know. But I suspect there are other broadcasts. And I certainly haven't had time to, you know, dig around and be able to find that out. But again, it would give a much more uh, fuller picture of what was used in prayers, what themes came up, uh, how the structure was used. So I think I've discovered some sources which point to the way forward for people that want to dig further. I don't believe it will change my basic narrative, but it will enrich it and deepen it. Yeah, indeed. The thing that I've learned about you uh, over the years is I've uh, grown to know you is uh, both uh, you you manage to find projects where there's an un, unmined treasure trove of resources, and this certainly seems to be to fall under that category. And then I, I it's also wonderful to observe you yourself as you sort of tackle these topics because you you take on a an enthusiasm and a, almost childlike love for uh, these topics that uh, it is a very enviable uh, model to, to follow. Um, and it, it, I have to think that even as we're going through what we're going through right now in this pandemic, that uh, uh, it, it encourages, all, encourages us all to keep um, observing 
the changes that are going on around us as uh, worship moves from uh, from live to uh, um, uh, to uh, virtual, so to say, and uh, and to sort of ponder what uh, what potential uh, permanent changes this might uh, make, uh, at least in the near future. So, yeah, yeah. we we live at a time when there's going to be changes. And uh, all, all churches are going to face that, particularly the experience of, at the moment, online worship. Yeah. Um, you know, before it was experimented with, it was uh, a side thing. Now it has become the thing that we have to live with at the moment. And that's going to change things. Um, I claim no prophetical um, uh, abilities, so I, I, I can't tell you exactly what that will be. Um, Church of Scotland is probably in a good situation to more easily adapt than churches like the Church of England, where there's much more a rigorous and um, complicated process of liturgical revision. Um, but I think the Church of Scotland um, will be will be find it easier to get to where they need to be than some other churches, where uh, it's a, a, a more cumbersome form of uh, liturgical revision and improvisation. But there's a, a good. Um, quote from, I, I, at the beginning I said, uh, well, this really started with uh, Dr. Robert Lee at Greyfriars in the um, uh, late 1850s and early 1860s. And there's a quotation here that probably uh, we all do well, the Church of Scotland and every other church uh, might take, uh, take to heart. He said this, we cannot make yesterday today. However, we may cherish its memory, or value its lessons. It is gone, dead and buried, and we inherit only the legacy it has bequeathed to us. Change is the order of the universe, the normal condition of all things mundane and human. Man may modify, he cannot prevent or arrest it, he may use it for his own benefit, but he can no more abrogate this than any other of the laws of nature. The chariot of divine providence still moves on in its glorious course, but it crushes those who stand in its way. I think that's really good. <laughs> those are amazing words and words that uh, I think we'll use to close this uh, short conversation with. Brian, thanks very much for uh, this chat today. Great to see you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, you. to everyone uh, okay. at home, we, we wish you well and, uh, and safe journey through these uh, very strange and stressful pandemic days. Uh, keep an eye out on our website, ism.el.edu, for more resources that we'll be uh, pulling out in the coming weeks and months. And uh, we wish you all well and uh, look forward to the next time we're together. Thank you very much.